Hello and a warm welcome to The 51%, a show about women reshaping our world. I'm Claire Pride, filling in for Annette Young. Coming up. To mark International Day of Zero Tolerance for Female Genital Mutilation, we report on efforts in Egypt to eliminate the practice. Plus, a French volleyball star on a mission to give her sport a higher profile. And we hear from Nikki Gemmel, whose book, With My Body, is about a woman's path towards empowerment. First to Egypt, where more than 90% of women under 50 have been subjected to female genital mutilation. But the procedure is becoming less common and rights groups have been encouraged by a decision we mentioned last week to imprison a doctor whose 13-year-old patient died after the operation. Sonia Dridi and Catherine Viet report now on the delicate efforts to address cultural norms and traditions. No to female genital mutilation, a clear message illustrated by these drawings. In this class in the village of Asu, teachers have organized a female anti-circumcision workshop among the students. Some have already gone the operation, like Samia. This is a picture of a girl who's been cut, and that's why she's so upset. The operation is usually done when the girls are between 7 and 13 years old. Many don't know what genital mutilation is beforehand due to lack of communication in their families. We talk about it in simple terms. I don't directly mention their genital organs. I use images and examples, like ears, for instance. I ask them how they would feel if someone cut part of their ear. When the children learn something at school, they immediately tell it to their parents. This way, we're building better communication between children, school and families. Even the boys are getting the message. There's not one verse in the Quran which says girls should be cut. It causes bleeding and all sorts of diseases, and girls end up becoming ill. In 2008, Egypt banned the practice, but it still remains widespread in rural and working class areas. In this village in the south of the country, the vast majority of married women are circumcised. For many, it's primarily a tradition associated with the purity and chastity of young girls. Yes, I had my daughter circumcised. You just cut off a bit and it saves the girl's chastity. Just a small part so the woman doesn't become sexually frigid, yet her libido remains within the norm. At this NGO, volunteers are raising awareness of the risks associated with FGM. For over 10 years, they've organized conferences and spread the word to locals. We've seen many successes since 2003. When we started, the people didn't know what to think. Many shut the door in our face. But thank God, we were able to change a lot of people's ideas. Among those who've changed their minds, this mother, who circumcised her first daughter, but not her second. This one didn't get cut because of what I learned here. With the older one, I didn't know any better, so I followed the custom that we've been brought up with, do this, do that. But I wasn't convinced because when it was done to me, it really hurt. So I didn't want to do this to my children. The change in mentality is also thanks to the involvement of religious and local leaders. Next door, we find an imam, a priest and a doctor. The men know each other well. For years, they fought together against FGM. The imam is also fighting against a preconceived idea that female circumcision is a religious obligation. If I had full responsibility here in Egypt, there would be a penalty for anyone who does this sinful action to a girl. The penalty would be that we cut a piece of him, just like he cut a piece of her. This practice is forbidden by Islamic law, and there is not one single correct reference to it in Islam. In 2007, the Grand Mufti of Egypt issued a fatwa that Islam prohibits genital mutilation. The doctor explains to people the risks of cutting, bleeding, infertility or complications during delivery. Nearly 400 kilometers north of the city of Asut lies Cairo, the Egyptian capital. We meet Vivian Fouad, one of the pioneers in the fight against FGM in Egypt. She's happy the practice is declining 
In her view, the recent manslaughter conviction of a doctor whose patient died after he performed the operation is a real turning point. Yes. I'm very positive to the, to, to the future because now, after this uh, historic uh, conviction, FGM become no more tradition. It's become a crime. Until the day when this practice is eradicated in the country, this theater company is breaking the taboo. The plays perform throughout Egypt. The actors say their performances are generally well received. In Nepal, child marriage was banned decades ago, and yet kidnapping girls to force them into marriage persists. Many of them come from small villages and towns where poverty is rife. And in some cases, children are even married off in exchange for money. Rights campaigners say that as well as tackling poverty, education is key. While out collecting firewood as a child, Susmita was abducted. Four days later, she was forced into marriage. Until at 13, under the cover of night, she fled her husband's home. I had gone to the forest to get firewood when I was kidnapped. I really missed school, so I ran away and returned to my parents' home to study. Like Susmita and her mother before her, UNICEF estimates four out of ten girls in Nepal are taken and married against their will, despite a half-century ban on the practice. The majority of victims come from the impoverished and often segregated Dalit community. There are many reasons for high rates of child marriage among Dalits. The main reasons are poverty, lack of education and discrimination by other communities. In particular, they still follow their old customs. They have not changed like other communities. Surveys show that three out of four Dalits marry during their teens or earlier. Dana Sunar loved school and dreamed of becoming a teacher before she was kidnapped at 14 and forced to marry a farmer. Marriage has eaten up my life. I haven't been able to read or write or finish my education. My whole life will be wasted doing farming work. Campaigners say laws have done little to end the practice. Instead, they focus on raising awareness through street plays, radio shows, and after-school child clubs. Girls like Susmita need little convincing. I think child marriage is a terrible thing. No one should be married at such a young age. But with a monthly family income of $80, education is a luxury for her and many others. A reminder that the battle to bring change to a community imprisoned by poverty and discrimination has only just begun. Turning our attention now to one of the only sports where female players are sometimes paid more than men, and that's volleyball. We went to meet Victoria Rava, who plays for Cannes on the French Riviera. She's a feminist and says a woman's salary should reflect her talent. Mariam Saab has more. 19 championship titles in 20 years. The girls from Cannes are not only the best volleyball players in France, but they're the highest paid. Team captain Victoria Rava was born in Georgia. The star attacker has been a French citizen for 13 years. At 39, Rava is better paid than most men in the sport. It's not out of the ordinary. Just because I'm a woman doesn't mean that I should be paid less. We should be judged on our talent and standard of playing. We work on the court. We have children to take care of and homes to keep. So now that I think about it, women deserve more recognition than men, right? It's a team of mostly international players. According to the club's president, scouting and training local talent presents more of a challenge. She says sport is still considered a man's domain. It's time for a revolution. Sports administrative bodies in France are still mostly governed by men. We're at my husband's restaurant. To supplement her income, Victoria Rava works here too, although her main priority is raising her young daughters. 
They really help out a lot, and they're also very independent girls. <laughs> Rave's league contract was renegotiated once she decided to have children. Flexibility not afforded to all women. So the sports star is using her platform to lobby for gender equality. Unfortunately, I think that we have reached the point where we must impose our needs. I'm from communist origins, and we insist. Cannes volleyball captain has a set game plan. Rava is determined to shine a light on women's sport and encourage a wider pool of female talent. The raw underbelly of female sexuality, that's what Nikki Gemmel says her books are about. And a decade after creating a stir with the bride-stripped bear, the Australian writer's latest erotic novel, With My Body, is out in French. She told France 24's Eve Jackson she believes women become more confident with age and so their sex lives improve. I wrote With My Body in my 40s. And it kind of tracks a woman's journey of sexuality. And for me, it was quite extraordinary. I think for a lot of women that, you know, as we get older, as we enter our 40s, we find our voice. We learn to say no to things we don't like. We get kind of bolshy about these things. But I also think we can have the best sex of our lives because we loosen we let go. We let go of all those barriers that we put up around us and, and you know, we're, we're not so worried anymore more about how other people perceive us. It's just like, ah, this is me. Take it or leave it. And I think that's extraordinarily empowering. So I wanted to write a journey in With My Body about a woman's uh, uh, path towards empowerment. That's it for this edition. If you'd like to comment on what you've just seen, you can head to our Facebook page, France24.51%, or send us a tweet at underscore 51%. Thanks for your feedback so far. Do keep those comments coming in. Until our next programme, bye for now.